Okay. Okay, let's remind you that uh, NO are the surreal numbers. Then uh, we have inside the surreal numbers big uh, uh, omega is the class of monomials. Class of uh, monomials. So this means that um, each element of big omega, actually this is uh, bigger than zero, each element of big omega is the simplest representative of, it, of its Archimedean class, right? And we know that, for instance, little omega the, is uh, a surreal, um, a monomial. This is a group, multiplicative subgroup, multiplicative subgroup. And uh, um, we know that for every surreal number, every non-zero surreal number, there exists a unique uh, monomial, M, such that X is comparable to M, which means that uh, there exists, uh, that it's bounded in absolute value by an integer multiple of, uh, of that and, and conversely. Actually, I don't need to put uh, absolute value here because it's positive. Okay, so then we have seen with Vincenzo that, so this implies that uh, uh, there exists a real such that uh, actually a non-zero real such that X is asymptotic to the real times the monomial. So this is the first order development of X. So X is comparable to a monomial and it's asymptotic to a monomial times a real number. Then once you have this, you, this means that X is equal to Rm plus something smaller, some uh, Y with Y strictly smaller, actually strictly dominated by X. You iterate, and then you write x equal r zero m zero plus. So you now you develop y, and so you are going to write uh, r zero m zero r one m one plus r two m two until you have uh, a remainder which is zero. Uh, so you, you are going to write this in the form i less than alpha real times a monomial. And uh, we have, uh, you, you have seen with uh, Vincenzo that uh, this is well defined. This infinite sum is well defined. So if y is zero, if the remainder is zero, you keep going. Otherwise, you develop y, you, you get an extra term. At some point, if you have uh, at limit stage, when alpha is a limit ordinal, these sums are defined in, uh, in the natural way, right? So um, if alpha is limit, the summation ri mi is the simplest surreal such that uh, for every ordinal strictly less than alpha, if you truncate the sum at level beta, then uh, um, 
uh, the simplest real, let's call it, uh, let's call it uh, uh, Z, such that this is comparable to M beta. So it's a, another way of saying what Vincenzo already explained, no? So these infinite sums are defined by induction on alpha. At successor stage, it's clear what you do. You add an extra term and at limit stage, you do this. But then the theorem is that every surreal, sorry, I'm mixing up a lot of things in this slide, but this has been explained last time. So. Uh, there are two there are two things here first is the definition of infinite sum the infinite sum is defined by you these mis are a decreasing sequence of monomials and the infinite sum is defined in the obvious way if alpha is a successor ordinal by induction if alpha is a limit ordinal is defined as the pseudo limit as the simplest pseudo limit of the partial sums. Simplest pseudo limit means the simplest uh, uh, surreal such that if you take the difference with the partial sum, you are uh, comparable with uh, the uh, next monomial that you haven't. Uh... Okay, then the theorem is, this is the definition of infinite sum. The theorem is that every uh, surreal number non-zero surreal number can be expanded in such an infinite sum by iterating. Um, and of course, the zero surreal number can, be, can also be expanded, can, can be identified with the empty sum with alpha equal zero. Okay. So this means that uh, um, this gives an isomorphism between the surreal numbers and certain abstract fields of infinite sums. So these, these were called so-called Han fields. Han fields. So recall that M is an ordered multiplicative group and then you have the Han field with the uh, monomials from M and coefficients and real coefficients is a field whose elements are uh, let's say functions from monomials to reals such that such that the support support of f namely the set of uh, monomials such that fm is different from zero is reverse well ordered, reverse well ordered. Um, okay, and then we have seen that uh, as, as a matter of notation, this function will be written in the form F uh, M times M. Just a moment, just a moment. Okay, are you there? 
Yeah, we hear. We lost your uh, sh the screen you're sharing. Ah. With the screen. Okay. Okay. Sum and uh, sum and product are defined in the natural way. So this is this has, uh, has already been done. Uh, okay, um, and we have seen an example. If m is take take a variable and take take the group of uh, um, integer powers of your variable. And this is just going to be Laurent series. So something like uh, something like um, uh, 3x squared plus 2x plus 4 plus x to the minus 1 minus 2x minus 2 plus blah, 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 blah. Okay, what is important is that uh, the monomials appearing are decreasing with, uh, uh, are decreasing, so the, the support is reverse well ordered. Okay, so now this is something called the purely infinite part, purely infinite. Then there could be a constant term. Sorry, pure infinite ends up here. Yeah. Then there is a constant term, this one, and then there is an infinitesimal tail. Okay, in this special case, the purely infinite part consists in finitely many terms, but this is just an accident. This depends on the fact that uh, the group of monomials is in some sense Archimedean in the multiplicative sense. But in general, if you have a bigger group of monomials, you may have uh, an, a purely infinite part which consist of infinitely many terms. Okay, this is the notion of hand fields. And on each hand field, you have a notion of summability. Um, let, me, let me also introduce another notation. This will also be written in the form of summation i less than alpha real m i, where, where m i i less than alpha is a decreasing enumeration of the support. Decreasing enumeration of the support of F. So there are three different notations here. You can view an element of this field, either as a function which assigns to each monomial its coefficient. This, you can write it in this form as a sum indexed by monomials. 
but then you require that the support that is reversed well ordered, so most coefficients will be zero. Or you can write it, you can write it as a sum index by an ordinal, in which case you only uh, mention the non-zero coefficients, right? So you enumerate the support, and in this case, the, the coefficients are non-zero. So just three different ways of uh, writing the same object. Um, okay. Now, there is the, an important notion of summability, which has already been mentioned. Summability. Suppose you have a family of elements in, uh, in a given hand field. So each of them will go is going to be an infinite sum, a possibly infinite sum. You would like to define when possible the sum of all these elements. Okay, this cannot always be done. It can be done only if this, the, the family is summable. So definition fi is summable if this already this also has been already explained but let me repeat the union of the support the supports is reverse well ordered And secondly, um, for each monomial, each monomial appears in finitely many, in the supports of finitely many FIs. More precisely, the set of indexes such that the monomial appear in the support of FI is finite. Another way of uh, stating the same uh, definition, in other words, um, you have a point two, two, and um, there is no weakly increasing sequence of monomials um, such that each mk belongs to the support of some fi right so because of course if you if you get uh, uh, such a sequence you cannot define the sum no because in the sum the monomials should decrease so if you get an increasing sequence you cannot define the sum um, Okay, um, then in this case, if fi is summable, the sum is defined by, in the obvious way, by adding the coefficients of the corresponding monomials. Alessandro? Yes. Yes, sorry. This uh, second number two is equivalent to one and two before, I think. Yes, yes. Okay. So two and one prime. 
So one and two, I mean, it, one prime is another way of, uh, uh, yeah, it is the same, no? So you would like to prove that uh, there is no weakly increasing sequence of monomials such that each monomial belongs to the support of some fi. Yeah, it's a exercise. It's equivalent to one and two. I mean, if you prefer the, the, the first definition, you just stay with the first definition. I, I believe I believe you want to say strictly increasing here. Um, otherwise, the cost and sequence would be always a counterexample. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, okay, yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes, yes, strictly increasing, sorry. Okay, in particular, the constant sequence is never summable, right? Because it con if it contains a monomial, you cannot add the same monomial infinitely many times. Okay, now the, uh, there is a th somehow difficult theorem, which is Neumann's lemma. I know. Let me first say something else. The surreals as a directed union of hand fields. Okay. So um, let um, let F be the family of all um, subgroups of omega serial monomials which are sets. No, this one is a proper class. You take the family of all subgroups which are sets rather than proper classes. Then the theorem is that the surreal monomials can be identified are canonically isomorphic to the union for M belonging to F of Rm. So the surreals are not literally a hand field, are a directed union of hand fields. You take the union over all hand fields which are based on sets. So the serials themselves are a proper class, but it can be presented as uh, a union in the following way. In particular, okay, so because this, this, this object doesn't really make sense. Does not make sense in, uh, in uh, gödel bernays set theory. So it's, uh, but if it makes, you, maybe you can, you can define it in some, in some way, but then it's not going to be equal. It's going to be, if it makes sense, it's bigger, no? We are not really defining it. Maybe it can be defined in, a, in some big set theory, but in any case, it's not what we want. It's too big. Why it's too big? Because each surreal number can be represented as 
an infinite sum, but the support of this infinite sum is in any case a set. So the support of a serial number is always a set of monomials. It's never a proper class of monomials. So the proper way of, uh, set of presenting the surreals is in this way. How do you define uh, this isomorphism proof? Okay, you take, um, you take F as a real number, you write the uh, Conway normal form, which I hope, if I remember correctly, has been explained. Namely, you develop it as an infinite sum of surreal monomials. And you send it to essentially the same sum, but taken inside this field. Sum of the uh, summable family. R I M I here. So there is a an identification that you can make. So you have F here, and essentially F goes to its Conway normal form. But the Conway normal form makes sense also in uh, in the in the other context in these unfields. So I hope this clarifies in which sense the surreals can be presented as a suitable field of generalized power series. This is the high level presentation of the surreals. You have the low level, which, has, which is just a surreal is a binary sequence, but it's impossible to do computations there. But this is the high level uh, presentation as a set of uh, a class which is a union of unfields. This is sometimes called, this is sometimes indicated with the, with the notation R omega ON. ON stands for the fact that you have to restrict that the support cannot be a proper class. The support must be indexed by an ordinal. It cannot be a proper class, right? So, surreal. In some sense, if you look at, um, notice that for those that know some valuation theory, the value group of uh, the of the of the surreals is i mean omega is a group of monomials so it's an isomorphic copy of the value group so in, in some sense this is a fixed point equation satisfied by the surreals right omega is a multiplicative copy of the value group so in some sense, the surreals are a field whose value group is isomorphic to the surreal themselves. And it's a kind of fixed point equation satisfied by omega depends on the surreals. So it's the value group essentially. So this is a, a kind of fixed point equation satisfied by the surreals. It's not a definition, however, there are many groups satisfying which are isomorphic to their own value group. So there are many fields whose additive group is isomorphic to the value group of the field. The serials are one of them. Okay, so this is, this is the, situ the situation. Um, okay, I am up to, um, okay, now we have, now that we have this high level representation, we can start doing some interesting computation. Um, okay, so um, we have given the definition of summable. 
and then we have some facts. Uh, Newman's lemma. Okay, if epsilon is a surreal, an infinitesimal surreal, so it's big, less than less than in uh, absolute value than any rational numbers, any non-zero rational numbers, then uh, the family epsilon n is summable. The powers of epsilon form a summable family. More generally, if you take real numbers are n, this is summable. Actually, the summability doesn't depend on uh, which real numbers you put. If it's summable with, uh, I mean, these two are really equivalent. This is summable. So you can define can define this where P is. So you can have, you can evaluate P is um, a power uh, P is a power series. You can evaluate any power series at, in, at an infinitesimal element. So in particular, in particular, you can define, for instance, uh, exp of epsilon, some epsilon n, n factorial. You can define the exponentiation of uh, an infinitesimal element. We will later see that you can actually also define the exponentiation of infinite elements, but in a different way. So in particular, so exp of uh, omega, 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 one over omega is infinitesimal, so this makes sense. Omega to the minus n over n factorial. This makes sense. Why it makes sense? Because omega to the minus n is a decreasing sequence of uh, monomials. But but this is wrong. This is wrong. I mean. You cannot define x of omega via the Taylor series. Why? Because in this case, omega to the n is an increasing sequence. The tail should become smaller and smaller, not bigger and bigger. So this is not summable. Omega to the n is not summable, but omega minus one to the n is summable. So we need a different idea to define exponentiation of an infinite element. For infinitesimal elements, you can just define, uh, you can just use the Taylor series using Neumann's lemma. But for infinite elements, you need a different approach. Okay, so Neumann's lemma, I would like to give a proof because it's not, it's slightly difficult. But first, let me do a special case. Newman's lemma, of course, works not only in, uh, in the surreals, but Newman's lemma works uh, also in, uh, in the surreals, but also in, in any field. We say this, the surreals are a directed union of unfields. Newman's lemma can be stated for unfields, and then uh, once you prove it for unfields, it works in the surreals as well. Um, 
Okay. Exercise. Uh, if you work in the unfilled, uh, in this particular unfilled, then uh, it's clear that uh, then x x sorry x 1 over x this is well defined in this particular unfield and more generally if epsilon less is uh, in this particular case, you can give a direct proof of Newman's lemma for this particular group of monomials. This group is particularly simple and you can prove, uh, you can prove Newman's lemma directly. Why? Because uh, uh, what up? What is what is special in this uh, in this case is um, that X is the least positive monomial in this particular case. So if epsilon is infinitesimal, epsilon the, epsilon to the n is even more infinitesimal and x to the n x to the n uh, actually x to the minus n is the least uh, i mean all monomials okay epsilon let, let me give you a hint. If epsilon is infinitesimal, then epsilon cannot contain a constant term, so it contains, it starts with x minus one or maybe x minus two. I mean, it cannot contain uh, x or uh, x square, otherwise it cannot be infinitesimal. But then it means that epsilon to the n starts with r1 to the n x minus n plus smaller terms. And this guarantees that this is summable. You do it as an exercise, but in general, in general, in an arbitrary, in the surreals or in an arbitrary unfield, it's much more complicated to prove this lemma. Um, maybe let's see if I can do it now, or maybe I'll do it later. Let me do it later. Let's first draw some conclusions from, from Newman's lemma and then I prove it later. Okay. Let's define, let's consider restricted analytic functions. Restricted analytic functions. Okay, suppose you have an open uh, an open domain in the in the reals, and you have f. Sorry, I shouldn't call it omega. I should call it u. And you have you have an analytic function defined on this open domain, real analytic function. Okay, now I can define u tilde the infinitesimal neighborhood of u inside the surreals. 
So you have some domain U here, and uh, you have uh, around each point, you take an infinitesimal neighborhood, and now you are inside the surreals. And I would like to extend the function, the analytic function to a function on the surreals. And I do it as follows. Uh, suppose, for suppose for simplicity that R equal one. n equal one. Okay. Um, if you have a real number, then since F is analytic, Uh, there is a Taylor series. Let summation of uh, um, the um, sorry. take the Taylor series of of uh, of F. Sorry. Taylor series of F at the real. So you consider the Taylor expansion of F. And you define F, the F tilde, the, the extension of F to the surreals at R plus an infinitesimal, just to be that the Taylor series evaluated at uh, uh, epsilon. Okay, so this makes sense for uh, Neumann's lemma. This converges. And you have that this is an extension of F to the, to the, to the, to the, um, Uh, to, to the surreals. Of course, for instance, you can define sign of, uh, uh, I don't know, three plus an infinitesimal. No, three it doesn't look good. Four plus an infinitesimal via the Taylor series. So sign of, on the reals, it coincides with F. On the reals plus an infinitesimal. So you have, this is the picture. You have the surreal, the, the surreals here. Inside the surreals, you have the real numbers, but they are not cofinal. The convex all of the reals are the finite elements. And you can define, for instance, the sign of finite elements. You cannot, however, define in a, in a reasonable way sine of omega. This cannot be defined in a, in a reasonable way because in some sense, sine of omega should be a random number between minus one and one. There is no canonical way of uh, picking a reasonable value for sine of omega. Instead, we will see that there is a reasonable way of defining x of omega. So all the analytic functions restricted to the finite part can be defined just by the Taylor formula using the fact that uh, 
no man's lemma gives you uh, a summable sequence. Some particular functions like exp and log can also be defined on, on infinite elements. Now there is an exercise, which is exercise, which is too difficult for me to do, but you can certainly do it, is that uh, if you extend functions in this way, then uh, this way of extending functions is well behaved with respect to composition. It also works in several variables. In several, in, several, in several variables, of course, you should use Taylor expansions in several variables. And this exercise is particularly important because it's the key to prove using uh, um, uh, corollary of the exercise, using the uh, work of uh, Van den Dries, McIntyre and Marker. Uh, well, in the slides, there will be proper references. Um, essentially, let me say it in this way, the surreals form a model of the un. Okay, let, let me say more precisely. Let me say this more precisely. What is Tian, first of all? Um, I guess this is 94. Okay. Um, okay, let me define the uh, you have uh, um, Tian is going to be the theory, the first order theory of R n. So I have to define R n. R n is going to be the field of real numbers. with all restricted analytic functions. What is a restricted analytic function? If F is analytic as above, If F is analytic and U contains, let's say, minus one, one to the N, then the restriction, the restriction of F is by definition the restriction of F to minus one, one to the N. And then you put all this all this, uh, uh, you, oh no, you put in the language a symbol for each restricted analytic function. And you do, and you do the corresponding, uh, uh, the corresponding, you interpret these analytic functions also in the surreals. You, interpret um, okay this is in the reals you interpret this in the surreals as f tilde restricted to minus one one to the n but in these times in the surreals Minus one one. I choose minus one one just to choose a compact interval. 
doesn't really matter because in principle I can define f tilde on uh, all the finite elements of the surreals if u if f is analytic everywhere. But just to keep with uh, uh, the the official definition of R n is is the following. So if you if you put on the on the surreals all these restricted analytic functions, you get an elementary extensions of the reals. This is the content of the of the theorem, and this based on the axiomatization of Tian given by Van den Dries, McIntyre, and Marker, and the essential the essential axioms of that of that axiomatization is is is, is this that composition works well. Once you know that composition works well, then uh, you, uh, you, you, you deduce from the axiomatization given by Van den Dries, McIntyre, and Marker that uh, you get an elementary extension. OK, so the next goal is to define a global exponentiation. global exp. So to sum up, you can define restricted exp, restricted sine and cosine, and you can define any restricted analytic function, but only on finite elements. For exp, you can also define a global exp. Let's see how. You cannot use the Taylor series because we say it's that uh, exp of omega cannot be defined via the Taylor series because you, you don't get a summable family. You must use some other, some other idea. OK. The other idea comes from uh, the so-called uh, research axioms. OK. Let k be, I mean, the goal is to define a global exponentiation in such a way, in such a way so that um, let, let me write it uh, this way. Uh, so you, you would like to ensure that the, the surreals with all the analytic restricted analytic functions and the exponential function is again an elementary extension of the reals. This is the goal. So you must understand how can you ensure that something is an elementary extension of the reals. I mean, I don't know if the students understand the notion of elementary extension. It means that every formula, every first order formula with the real parameters involving in the language with a symbol for each analytic function and exponentiation is true in the reals if and only if it's true in the surreals. Maybe I'll present some examples later. So the reser axioms give you the following. There is the following theorem. Theorem. This, um, so let, I, I will phrase the theorem in a slightly non-standard form. I hope it's correct. You correct me if, if wrong, if I'm wrong. So let K um, be a real closed field. A real close ordered field, which so something elementary equivalent to the reals. Remember that a real close field is an ordered field with the property that every polynomial with coefficients in k which changes sign as a root in k. 
for instance, the reals themselves, but not the rationals, because x squared minus two changes sign in the rationals, but doesn't have a root because square root of two is not there. So let k be a real closed field. And let e be an exponential function. An exponential function is simply an isomorphism from uh, the additive part to the multiplicative part. So it's a, it's a bijection, which, I mean, in other words, e x plus y equal e x times e y. And preserves the order. Suppose that you have three properties, this, the restriction of e to minus one one k okay, with the restriction of e to minus one one is a model of the theory of the reals with restricted exponentiation. So exponentiation works works well on uh, let's say finite elements or elements between minus one and one. And the third property is E X bigger than X plus one for all X. Then this is a model of global exponentiation. So in order to have a field with an exponential map, which behaves well, it suffices that behaves well on finite elements. And then satisfies this property. I mean, usually this is not stated in this form, but I guess it's equivalent to the usual formulation. The usual formulation is that if X is infinite, If x is infinite, then e x is bigger than x to the n for every n. But I guess it's equivalent of uh, uh, to the one I, I, I've given. For instance, uh, uh, you you from three you get from three you get the following that uh, e. Uh, uh, E x times E x, for instance, is uh, bigger than one plus x, one plus x is bigger than x square. And this is on the other hand is E to uh, two x. So you, you, here you have something growing linearly with X and here you have something growing polynomially with X. So exercise three implies three prime using this idea. The reason I prefer three is that it's a single axiom instead of a scheme of axioms. So this shows that the theory, the theory of global exp is finitely axiomatized over the theory of uh, restricted exp. And in particular, if the theory of restricted exp is decidable, then the theory of global exp is decidable and it's an open problem whether it's decidable or not. So the proof of uh, the, the theorem, this theorem can be deduced from uh, so 
two and three are the so-called, one to three are the so-called reserves axioms. The, the origin is an extended abstract of reserve 93, but without complete proofs. A complete proof of this theorem can be deduced easily from, uh, again, um, the paper that I mentioned before, uh, Van den Dries, uh, McIntyre, and Marker. Uh, no, sorry, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm speaking about a different paper. So this is, um, no, this is a different paper. Uh, sorry, I'm a bit confused now. This is a paper of uh, 2001 of, uh, uh, am I right here? Some help with the... I think it's this one, 2001 and uh, the same of us. Well, and this is marker. Well, the theory of the real uh, ordered field with, uh, well, no, okay. I forgot the title. <laughs> no. Okay. So then, if you want, um, okay. Actually, to be super precise, the theorem of uh, Vernon Dries McIntyre and Marker shows something slightly different because works in a language in which you have all restricted analytic functions and exponentiation as well. Here you don't have all restricted analytic functions in this formulation, but it can be deduced nevertheless using Robinson's joint embedding theorem. So uh, you, you can, uh, in, the, in the survey that uh, I, I wrote, which is the basis for these lectures, you can you can look at it. There are uh, you know just few lines of uh, proofs using Robinson's joint embedding theorem explains how to deduce this formulation from uh, the formulation in which you have all restricted analytic functions. Okay, now the goal is to define a global exponentiation on the surreals. Okay, the key property is the following. The key property is that you would like to ensure that exponentiation grows faster than any polynomial. And you also like you would like also to ensure that uh, exponentiation works well on uh, finite elements. On finite elements we know what to do. We use the Taylor formula and we use some mobility to ensure that it converges. We have to decide what to do on infinite elements. So uh, global exp on the surreals. Okay, now, first of all, the surreal numbers We said that they can be represented in a power series. So they are isomorphic to some field of power series with the, with the proviso that the supports are always required to be sets, despite the fact that the set of monomials is a proper class. This can be written, can be decomposed in three parts. the purely infinite elements plus the constants plus the infinitesimal elements. Every surreal can be written as a purely infinite part, which could be zero, but if it's not zero, is. So this is the part in, this is the class of surreals such that every monomial in the support is bigger than one. Bigger than one 
automatically means infinite because monomials are either uh, finite or uh, infinite. If it's bigger than one, it's infinite automatically, right? Or infinitesimals. So th this is the part. So for instance, for instance, uh, uh, something like uh, om omega three plus uh, three omega two plus four plus omega to the minus one plus omega to the minus two plus 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 plus, right? So this is the infinitesimal part. This is the real part. And this is the purely infinite part. Um, now, this is a decomposition as an R, an R vector space. as R vector space. So the surreals are an ordered vector space over the reals. And you can decompose it into as a direct sum of uh, three R vector spaces in the following way. A purely infinite part a constant part and an infinitesimal part. Okay. So if X is a surreal, you can write X as a purely infinite part, which I write it in this way, plus a constant part, which I write it in this way, plus an infinitesimal part. This is here, this is here, and this is here. Okay, clearly we want to define exp x as exp of the purely infinite part times exp to the constant part times exp to the infinitesimal part. This one is just a real number x zero. So this is just e to the x zero in the sense of the reals. On the infinitesimal part, you can use the Taylor formula. So the problem is how to define the exponentiation of an infinite part, of, an in, of, of a purely infinite surreal number. And in particular, you would like to define the exp of omega. And again, you cannot use the Taylor formula because the Taylor formula that you get is not, is not summable, right? Okay, then you do the following. Uh, first of all, you define the exponentiation of an infinite monomial. So the heuristic is that you want something which grows faster than any, mon any polynomial. So exp of uh, uh, if M is an infinite monomial, exp of M, for instance, like omega, X of M should be bigger than any polynomial in M. So it should be bigger than M to the K for each K integer. Should, should also be bigger than exp of uh, the left options of L. Remember that the left options of uh, a surreal number as are less than the surreal number and simpler than the surreal number. So this guy is already well defined by induction on simplicity. 
and on the other side and on the other hand it should be um oh sorry not only this but this to the k as well and should be smaller than x of uh, the right of any right option of m and also the kth root and here k ranges in uh, in uh, is an integer so this is a necessary condition for a good exponential function so for instance x of omega should be bigger than omega to the k for to omega square omega cube should also be bigger than x of something smaller a, mon a smaller monomial not not anything smaller a smaller well actually exactly what i wrote this is not an arbitrary thing smaller than m is a left option of of m and also to its powers you do this on monomials oh. yes can you hear me yes uh, a very very technical comment uh, so I, I hope i'm not breaking the flow now uh, in this particular formula, uh, those two M, L, M, R cannot be the options of M, but they should be the monomials, which are also left options and right options, but not every possible option. Uh, right, right, some right, options right, are not right, monomial, right, right. And, and for this inductive right. definition, you, you don't know those values yet. I was actually wondering about, about this. Okay. Um, uh, monomial options oh okay in other words this ensures that ml is not not is not only smaller than m but also for every n n times this is smaller than m because it's a monomial. Two monomials, if one is smaller than the other, then every integer of one is smaller, any, any positive multiple of one is smaller than the other. Yes, otherwise, there is no reason why this should remain smaller even when raised to the k. Okay, so this is what you do for, uh, for uh, um, monomials. Now, if you if you have a monomial raised to um, uh, if you if you have a monomial multiplied by a real number, you also have to decide what to do in this case. So here R is a real number, let's say non-zero. Then you do something similar. You do um, um, well. Um, uh, there is something. Yeah. Okay. Let me write R minus here. And R plus here. Where R minus and R plus range over rational numbers. Why rationals and not reals? Because it works for reals as, as well, but for rational numbers, you don't need exponentiation. 
to define something raised to a rational number. You just need to take roots. And I'm taking for granted that the real numbers are a real cross field. So it's, uh, it makes sense to, comp to, uh, to take those roots. Uh, there is something I forgot to say really in connection with uh, uh, Neumann's lemma, the proof that the surreal numbers, this is something that uh, we, we, we have never proved yet. We, we, we didn't prove yet, but I'm going to do it in a moment. They form a field. I forgot to say that. Let me finish this. Let me finish this. So I need two extra clauses. So um, remember that I need to define I need to define exp of a purely infinite serial number because we say that finite elements do not pose any problems. Infinitesimals I apply the Taylor series. Real numbers I just use the real exponentiation. The problem is what to do on purely infinite numbers. On purely infinite numbers, I'm going to do for, so for single monomials, these or monomials multiplied by reals. In general, a purely infinite number will be a sum. Let me first do the successor case a sum of monomials multiplied by reals, but I am in the case in which these monomials are all bigger than one because this guy is purely infinite. And here, of course, I do the obvious thing. So it's, it's exp of uh, Um, okay, if I have an infinite sum, but this, if the infinite sum has a last term, because the sum is indexed by a successor ordinal, then it's like the exp of A plus B. I do exp of A times exp, exp of B. I'm just using the fact that the exp is an exponential map. The last problem, is when I have an infinite sum, but indexed by a limit ordinal. And then I, I do, again, something very natural. I approximate the infinite sum with uh, the partial sums. And correspondingly, I approximate the x with the, the x of the partial sums. So I put the following bounds. So it's going to be exp of, so alpha here is a limit ordinal, alpha limit. So I take uh, I take all possible ordinals less than alpha. And I do this times, I truncate the summation at beta, so I take a partial sum. And then I, uh, I approximate from below the value of the exponentiation with exp of uh, the next term, which is m beta. Okay, but I cannot put r beta, I should put something because I don't know if it's an approximation from above or from below. So I put R beta minus. So something uh, something less than R beta, a rational number less than R beta. And similarly from above, maybe I should do some extra space here. Should use some extra space. And similarly, uh, I'm going to do exp of some i less than beta and i r i. 
times x of the next term are beta plus. I hope you, you write it. So here are beta minus range So I do an approximation procedure. So inside these brackets, I put all possible approximations of the following form. No? I truncate the sum and I approximate the next term after the truncated sum with uh, from above and from below. And then they take the simplest element between these lower bounds and these upper bounds. So it's very natural. And all these MIs are uh, uh, infinite monomials because for finite monomials, we, we do a complete, we, we use the Taylor series, right? So on, on, on infinitesimal elements, we use Taylor series. On infinite elements, we just try to reduce to a situation in which we can apply uh, reserves axioms. So we, we try to construct an expo uh, the simplest exponential function, which grows faster than any polynomial. This is the content of this first line x of a monomial should be bigger than any power. So this ensures that x grows faster than any polynomial. And then uh, there, there are uh, some obvious approximation procedures to do the, the rest. So this is the global exponentiation. And then there is the theorem. I think, I think this is Van den Dries and Ehrlich. which gives you that the surreals with all the restricted analytic functions and the global exp are an elementary extension of the reals with the global exp. Um, okay. Forgot to say something. What I forgot to say is that uh, the surreals is a field. I have, we have defined plus and times, and it's easy to, to see that it's a ring, but it's, we want to prove that the inverse exists. So how do you prove that the inverse exists in the following way? Uh, take x non-zero, then x is going to be a real times a monomial times something smaller. And I can write it uh, uh, plus something smaller, which I can write it in the following form, real times a monomial times one plus an infinitesimal. So one over X is then one over R, one over the monomial. I mean, the monomials form a group. So it makes sense to take the inverse of the monomial. And then I should take the inverse of one over of one plus epsilon. And here I use the Taylor series. This is the um, sum of uh, minus one to the n uh, epsilon to the n. And here I use a no man's lemma. Makes sense by no man's lemma. Um, okay, now 
we have uh, uh, really to um, either I prove Neumann's lemma, but it's a bit heavy, or let, let me first do something else. Then if I have time, I go to Neumann's lemma. Okay, let me first do something else. Exponential no normal form. Okay. So, um, we know that exp is an isomorphism from the additive group to the multiplicative group of the surreals. We also know that the surreals can be decomposed in a purely infinite part plus a real part plus an infinitesimal part. If you apply exp, you get a corresponding multiplicative decomposition into, uh, well, the reals just go to the positive reals. The infinitesimals just go to one plus infinitesimals. So exp of, uh, we know that exp of an infinitesimal is going to be summation, uh, the Taylor formula, right? So one plus uh, epsilon plus epsilon. So this belongs to one plus an infinitesimal. And the, what is the image of the purely infinite surreal numbers? Guess what? So the image of the purely infinite uh, surreal number should be a complement of this, but in the multiplicative sense. And what is the na most natural complement of this? These are just the finite elements positive finite elements, right? And a complement of this is just the class of monomials. So in other words, we are claiming that uh, the monomials are just the values of exp applies to a purely infinite elements. I mean, we already know that uh, as, an, as an illustration, uh, as an illustration of this second formula, if X is a surreal number positive, we know that X can be written as a real number times a monomial then times one plus an infinitesimal, right? So every, every surreal number actually, even, uh, even positive or not, can be written is in the same Archimedean class of a monomial, which means that it's asymptotic to a real number times a monomial, which means that it's equal to a real number times a monomial one plus infinitesimal. So this gives you a decomposition of X as a product of three uh, things. And this product is a product of a, a real number, one plus an infinitesimal and a monomial. And exp gives you this correspondence between this additive decomposition and the multiplicative decomposition. Now let's come to the exponential normal form. Exponential normal form is the following. If F is a surreal, then F can be written as a sum of monomials times real numbers. This is Conway normal form. But then since the monomials can be written in an exponential form, we can also write this as sum of 
exp of gamma i are i, where gamma i is purely infinite. And uh, we are saying that mi is exp of gamma i. And I'm going to also write, this, this one is the exponential normal form of f. So every serial number Now it starts looking like a transseries. So I'm also going to write e to gamma instead of exp of gamma for simplicity. So you, you, should, you should look at this expression as, and, and, and of course, these mi's are decreasing, are, dec are a decreasing sequence of monomials. So this, this gamma is are a decreasing sequence of purely infinite serial numbers. So roughly, in R, you have decimal expansions. So mention 10 to the I uh, digit I. And in, uh, in the surreals, you have this exponential representation. Um, exponential normal form. So mention e to the gamma i r i. So it's a kind of similar to both the reals and the surreals are filled with an exponentiation. And you can use the exponentiation to expand things in exponential normal form. Um, let me give an example. Because then this, and then I guess I need to stop in a few minutes, right? Example, this will clarify lots of things. But then I leave out Neumann's lamb, unfortunately. But this example is too beautiful. I don't want to leave it to Vincenzo. I want Vincenzo to do the Neumann's, the Neumann's proof because it's kind of complicated. Um, uh, OK, so now instead, let me give you, you the elementary uh, Let's compute the exponential normal form of, oh, first of all, a to the b is, of course, defined as uh, e to the b log a. Uh, I forgot to say, log is the inverse of exp, log is the inverse of exp. Why the inverse exist? Well, because the surreal numbers have all the elementary properties of the real numbers. And so in particular, uh, since uh, the real exponentiation has an inverse, uh, so it's a surjective and, and so also the surreal numbers should have an inverse. And the exercise log of one plus an infinitesimal is sum is given by the Taylor formula. Exercise. Okay. Example. Example, and then I finish with this example. Let's compute the exponential normal form of omega plus one to the omega. Okay. Omega plus one to the omega is equal to exp of omega log of omega plus one. 
just elementary calculus. This is a formula which is true in the reals, so it's true in the surreals because they have the same elementary theory. So this is going to be equal to um, um, I'm going to write log of uh, omega plus one as log of omega times one plus one over omega. I mean, omega plus one is omega times one over omega. So this is log of omega plus log of one plus omega to the minus one, just because log log of a times b is log of a plus log of b. Uh, so uh, now omega minus one, this is infinitesimal. So I can apply the Taylor formula. So this is log of omega plus sum i equal one to infinity of minus one and plus one omega to the minus uh, n over n, I suppose. Did I write it, did I write it well? Yeah. Or one minus one plus one is the same. Okay, now I plug this formula here. So I get, uh, what do I get? I get um, exp of um, uh, omega times log omega coming from here. And then they have the infinite sum there. Plus this infinite sum starts with the omega to the minus one minus omega to the minus square over two plus omega to the minus three over three. But then I have omega, I have this omega which multiplies my, my formula. Uh, so uh, this, um, this becomes one omega times omega to the minus one becomes one. Then I have minus omega, omega to the minus two over two becomes omega to the minus one over two plus dot, dot, dot. This is equal to, uh, well, exp of omega log omega, which is just omega to the omega. Then there is x of one, which is just e. Then there is x of the infinitesimal part, which is um, minus omega one over two plus blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this is uh, omega to the omega times e. Okay, now I'm going to use the fact that uh, Let's call this epsilon. This is infinitesimal. X of epsilon is sum epsilon to the n over n factorial. So it's going to be one plus epsilon plus epsilon over two plus blah, blah. So I'm going to plug that in. So this is going to be X of Sorry, this exp becomes a Taylor formula. I can apply the Taylor formula. So it becomes one minus omega minus one square plus dot, dot, dot. I mean, I, I, I would need to, to plug in the Taylor formula for exp of epsilon. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, I, I am essentially done e omega to the epsilon minus e one over two omega to the omega minus one plus dot dot dot. This is the exponential normal form. 
This is the exponential normal form of, uh, of that. I'm just using the usual rules for calculus. And this corresponds to the asymptotic expansion of, uh, instead of omega, consider a real, a real variable tending to infinity, then you get that x plus one to x is as an asymptotic expansion, which is given exactly by essentially this is a real expansion, e x to the x minus e one over two, x to the x minus one plus dot, dot, dot. So in some sense, this exponential normal form forms should be thought of as asymptotic expansions. Instead of omega, you have a real valued function. And the beauty is that an asymptotic expansion in general is something approximate. But these surreal expansions are not approximations. This is an equality, it's not an approximation. So one speaks in this context of super exact asymptotics. OK, maybe I will uh, uh, stop here. So in other words, let me just say that uh, um, we have defined a global exp. The thing to remember is With this global exp, something like omega to the omega here, omega to the omega cannot be expanded. It's already a normal form because omega to the omega is exp of omega log omega. This is, it turns out that this is a monomial. So this is a monomial. So this guy here is a monomial. If you work, it's of the form exp of a purely infinite number. So it's a monomial. It cannot be expanded. How do you recognize that it's a monomial? Simply because you have no rules to expand it. You have rule, the, the only rules you have to expand things are essentially the Taylor formulas. When you are stuck with the Taylor formulas, you end up with monomials. So either you create new monomials or you are able to apply the Taylor formula to expand your object. And if you start with uh, this, you get uh, some nice asymptotic expansion. And then I give you as an exercise to compute Uh, to compute this. And you will see that you will get an infinite sum which is transfinitely long, is indexed by an ordinal which is omega square rather than omega. And this is the beginning of trans series. The sort of objects that you get in this way are exactly trans series. Maybe I'll just stop here because I'm. I think I'm over the time. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you. Okay. Thanks.